Can they get it going on that angle? They have! She is in! The line-up mall is one of Rugby Union's most powerful weapons. It can be used to score tries, to create space for the attack, and it can get you into trouble in your own half. But how do you stop it? That's exactly what this special GDD coaching webinar is all about. Ex-England coach and World Cup winner Graham Smith joins me to explain how to defend the line-up mall. Good evening, everybody, and welcome to this very special webinar. Um, so uh, you may be aware that Gary Street has unfortunately been very unwell. So uh, Gary, former uh, England women's coach, uh, won the World Cup, uh, Graham's coaching partner, um, and has been very successful in his coaching life, and unfortunately has become very unwell. Uh, so we wanted to do something to support him and his family uh, to help them make the changes to their, their home that uh, they need for him to live a, a happy and, and healthy life going forwards. Um, so thank you to everybody who's already donated. Um, I will put a link down uh, down in the comment section uh, when I post the video, uh, post the recording. Uh, so please feel free to share uh, share far and wide so that as many people can enjoy one the webinar but also uh, support uh, support Gary's cause um so without further ado uh, Graham thank you very much for coming on to the webinar um I know that uh, you're a very busy man uh, so really appreciate it uh just quickly introduce yourself Graham good evening everybody and uh, uh welcome from Tallinn it's uh, 10 in the evening here a couple of hours ahead of yourselves uh, as Gary says, my name is Graham Smith. I was uh, assistant coach to Gary from 2007 to 2015. Um, we uh, did some pretty good things together. We had quite a unique relationship. Uh, if people know us, they'll know that. Uh, he's, in a, he's in a tough spot, and uh, I want to do everything that I can to uh, help him and his family have a have a brighter future uh the ironic thing about all this he would avoid this webinar like the plague on defending them all but uh there we go that's just one of ironies of life but it's a great topic uh and, uh, and while uh, gary would definitely uh, probably prefer the other elements of the game um i know there's lots of coaches really interested in it uh, and it's important to pick a topic that is so applicable um the reason i'm so interested in it is that it's the number one try scoring source in a game of rugby union um and that's certainly at the elite level uh it can have a huge impact uh all the way up the pitch so i think been able to defend it really well that becomes a weapon as well um which uh, certainly I, I take very great pride for my own team to be uh, strong on both sides of the ball at, at the mall i always believe that it that mauling is the two sides of the same coin and if you're a good team with the ball mauling you should be a good team in terms of how to defend the uh the mall and um it's um it's just making sure that people understand uh how we how we do that so i just want to run some of my principles on defending malls uh it, like everything in the game i believe especially at the collision points so uh rook uh tackle area mall if you if you have to think about what you're going to do the opposition will have probably done something before you can do what you need to do so it, it's a phrase i've used for many years you've got to see do if you think it gets in the way of what you're trying to achieve so getting that mentality of see do in all that we do to retain possession or recover the ball is really important Probably one of the most important things about mall defence is separate and isolate. Once a structure's built, it's very difficult to break it. And it's the same as a scrum in terms of doing the same thing at the same time. The big difference is the scrum is more or less a close skill where everybody is bound and tight together prior to the impact. Uh, uh, you try and build a mall on impact. And, and that makes it slightly different. Roles and responsibilities of each individual are really vital. You've got to understand what your role and responsibility is uh, on each place in the line out, 
on each phase of the defence. Probably the biggest decision, uh, depending on the area of the field, is do you stand down and try and defend it on the ground, or do you go aerial? Now, personally, I, I would try and go aerial as much as possible um, because if you can if you can challenge the ball in the air, then the ball can't be formed, and that's the first defence of it. Don't let it form. So, with England women, we had a, um, a, a rule of thumb where between the twenty twos in defence, we would always go aerial as much as possible, trying to get pods in the air, trying to put players under pressure. Once we got into attacking and defending 22s, then we would look at um, whether we were going to stand down, whether we were going to put one pod up. If one pod was going up the front, who was responsible for defending the head of the mall when it came down to the ground? What I had a little chat with Gant this afternoon and, and the law came up and um, I've got my own opinion on the law at the moment regarding the mall, but I'll try and steer away from that unless somebody asks. But I spoke with a good mate of mine this afternoon who has been a professional referee and is still a professional TMO. And uh, I just want to clarify things. As the law stands, this phrase of changing the bind is based on which arm you're binding with. Which arm is bound to the mall and which arm do you move? So if I'm bound with my left arm and I move my left arm, I've released my bind, okay? And that is where the referees and the ARs will look for a change of bind. Swimming basically is sliding down the side of the mall and never actually being binding properly. Uh, so they are slightly different, but it's the same thing of trying to put yourself in a position that compromises the attack. The player who can bind through the centre and go through the centre of the mall is always legal. They just work their way through the centre of the mall. And there's a couple of players in the world rugby at the moment who are extremely good at this. And uh, one of them is Mario Atoji, who we'll come on to a little bit later. Uh, and just to clarify, the hindmost foot, as in with the rook, is the offside line at the mall. So it's not the ball or where the ball might be, it's the hindmost foot. I did ask my friend, so what happens when the mall is spun like wheeling a scrum and you've got an attacker and a defender at the same end of a mall? Which foot is the offside? He didn't quite have an answer for me, but uh, we're gonna we're gonna we're gonna look into that. Um, the best way to look at it for those players on the outside and bound with one arm, if they stay bound and the mall spins, twists or moves, they are okay, which is why they can end up next to the attacking scrum half. Because my question is, are they not offside? And they're not offside because they don't go past the hindmost foot. They are the hindmost foot, which again comes back to my question earlier. Um, personally, I think this is something where we do need to look at law. And I, I'm not one for changing laws. I think we change them too often. But is spinning a mall the same as spinning a scrum? And should it be looked in that way? Just a, just a thought. Um, it looks wrong, but if they haven't changed or lost their bind, they are always legal. They may start at their end of the mall, but if it spins and they start, they end up at the other end of the mall, they are still legal. That is why they can be standing next to the attacking scrum half. Being isolated is one of the keys to good mall defence. If you can target um, space between lifters, jumpers, binds, then you can try and separate, isolate. Okay, it comes down to that key decision, are you going to go up or are you going to stay on the ground? Stay focused. Too many lose concentration at key moments. Watch any of, any game at any level, but particularly maybe more in the community uh, 
game where teams decide to stand down, but as the ball's throwing in, they look up at the ball going over. So they're not concentrating on what their role is or their responsibility is. They're actually looking at the ball with the head up instead of looking at feet on the ground and when they touch the ground. Risk versus reward. And, and this is, again, looking at how often you challenge in the air, how many pods do you challenge within the air, because it's a higher risk in terms of if they get the ball down quicker than your attacking pod in the air can get down, they've got the advantage of numbers. However, the reward is you stop the mall before the mall can start. The dominant team will be the team that stays connected. There's some very good video clips a little bit later where you can see the teams that stay connected and the teams that disconnect. The team that stays connected with a narrower profile will penetrate through the opposition. And what I mean by a narrower profile is that um, whether we're attacking or defending a wall, the head of the mall should be never more than three players wide. And then you've got to consider whether you go three, two, two, or you go three, three. Okay. Or you even go just three, two and leave two defenders out. Just, uh, it's a bit of a repeat, the last one. Just the last point here. Think about the mall defense as creating a running scrum. And like everything in the scrum, it's really about hard work, okay? So you've got to practice malls little and often, like you would practice scrum little and often. Generally, I will try and do a scrum and a mall um, practice on the same evening, so as that you can lead one into the other or bounce from one to the other. And also that adds in a little bit of conditioning because you're working through bodies. OK, so uh, sorry, you're working through uh, body conditioning. OK, so maybe one team scrummaging. The next team will then stand there waiting for a more and vice versa. And you just work through it that way. So let's just have a look at the, the plan that I use with England women and I still use today with my guys out here in Estonia. The reason for the parquet flooring and the circle here on the right is I have always used the phrase heavy, herringbone lock. Um, and this came from an old coach of mine a long time ago, mostly called uh, Dave Prothero. And if you look at how the herringbone lock is, the points go in. And the reason for this is that if you build a structure with heads on the outside and shoulders on the outside, you're going to spin or slip. If you can get heads on the inside of hips, then you'll lock in and you'll bind together more securely. So with this uh, diagram, the receiving pod is the front pod. And whether we're going up in the air or staying on the ground, the front three of the defending line out are going to target these spaces and the center player targets the ball receiver. The outside player here is going to target into behind the third player in the line out and turn that towards the touch line. So that the aim is to drive into touch. You've got three players working from the back of the line out to fill these spaces. Heads in, herringbone lock. Now the decision to be made is based on how well these six players here are doing. Because if these six players here are driving all these players back, the objective is to get these three moving before these three or four players here can drive in to set them all up. If you've got a successful drive, then the end of the line out and the hooker, they can stay and defend the seams of the line out, uh, the seams of the ball, sorry, on the edges. There's a couple of interesting videos later on that show this. Uh, so you can see this slide here looking at the center 
um, of the line out, uh, whether we're, it, it could be, depending on how far back a dummy at the front goes, depends on who takes responsibility. But generally, if we go into the middle of the line out, the principle is the same. We go inside to try and disrupt and we aim to drive straight through the centre of their line out to take away their support players. And again, if we can get the job done with a 3-3 a three, three or a 3-2-1, um, we can drop players or, or not even engage players so as they can defend the seams. If we get this really, really focused and driven, it's possible that we could actually have two players defending the seam here on this uh, this uh, middle ball. So again, it's isolate, it's target, it's roles and responsibilities, stop them all forming, stay connected and get your uh, body positions correct, your head positions correct. And again, on the last slide, it's the same thing. This time though, we're fo focused on driving them in field, driving them towards the posts to try and isolate any support that can come into them. If we can get this going, we can get our structure moving forward before they can build their structure in. And again, particularly uh, in this area, um, we want to make sure we've got that seam defended so as there's not a space that they could uh, spin off and attack through um, the, uh, the seam of our line-out uh, defence. So again, same principle, take the space, take the space, isolate, drive the ball, isolate and stop the structure being formed. Is there any questions at this uh, this particular moment in time? Could I just ask about the the back mall there, and yep. driving it in field? Does that not open up uh, space to attack a bigger blind side, basically? Uh, well, it does, um, but the likelihood is they're trying if they're going backwards they're trying to stabilize okay so if they feel if they feel driven pressure it's likely that they're going to try and take that pressure on the open side here because they'll feel the weight coming on the inside if they do come here then you should have uh, enough defenders who can uh, you know, you, you should have one spare anyway. You'll probably have your, your winger up here as well. Okay, so I think it's, again, risk-reward. You've got to know that it's, a, it's an opportunity for them. And if you know it's an opportunity, then you can defend it. Thank you. Depending on your accessibility to to information from the teams you play um and at this level at international level they will have analyzed each other to to the nth degree hours and hours of video going over from each other's line notes so the questions you've got to ask yourself are where where are we on the field so what they're potentially going to do um are we going to aerial challenge um uh, is the defence uh, plan is the same but more difficult with an aerial challenge, and I'll, I'll cover that as we as we go forward. So if you look here, front ball. Now, although they're a little bit tall, they're coming down, and the three first Irish defenders are looking at. Scrum cap defending the ball, and then these guys are going to try and isolate. Now, the French have already got their blocks on, okay? And the fourth guy in the line out, if you looked at uh, my diagrams, he saw a player in front of him, so he went straight into there. And they've left two players out to defend. So Ireland were confident that they could 
stop at source, potentially knowing that um, one of France's options is to just run and play, and they've got two defenders already waiting. Just watch how England disrupt this. It's not my cup of tea, to be honest with you, but this is this is England's disruption of Maul at the moment. This is where I struggle when you've got a player here and you're thinking that just doesn't look right. But anyway. So if you watch this again, Atology has license from England to be a, a lone assassin. He is doing everything he can to go through the center before they set up. Also, it's questionable when he, whether he's touching the player in the air, but he's certainly touching the, um, the rear lifter early. Okay, but the rear lifter's got his, um, his feet on the ground. And then everybody else is basically doing the roles that uh, we discussed earlier. They're trying to isolate. The big difference here is uh, Will Stewart at the edge here. His sole purpose is to try and spin this. He doesn't hit straight. He hits and spins immediately. And completely disrupts the whole process and turns it into a mess. Now... We have to have a lot of sympathy for the referee here because who could tell, unless you can clearly see somebody collapse that, who can tell through the chaos who was deliberately responsible for dropping that and uh, obviously gave it in uh, England's favour? Yeah, right. Gary, right. can I ask a question? Yeah, please do. Hi, Smithy, you all right? Um, How are you, mate? Yeah, good. Um, Geraint, thank you very much for doing this, by the way. It's very, very good of you. Thank you. Um, Graham, are you trying to, are you sort of hinting at maybe changing the offside line from the hindmost foot to the middle of the lineup, or from the middle of the moor? Is that what you're thinking? I think that it's something we need to consider or consider making spinning a moor illegal because it's unsafe. Okay. All right. Thank you. And I don't like changing laws, but that's one I think needs to be researched and looked into. Lovely. Thanks, mate. No problem. If you look at the initial impact from England here, Everybody's doing the job as described. In fact, they're doing it so well that the um, the Wales receiver hasn't yet got his feet on the ground. Now, my personal preference here would be to just now somebody come in and fill this space and just get that to the touchline. But England are all about this spinning. Remember what we said earlier about if you are bound with an arm and you move that arm, you've changed your bind. So here, Underhill for me, it should be a penalty because if you watch it, he changes his bind. So I believe England's process, whereas here I would want us to drive to touch, theirs is to turn it so as they have players, Wales's side of the mall, if you like, which puts the nine under pressure. There they turn it, there they turn it. It's pretty I effective, isn't the, it? Uh, so it's, it's interesting with, with that clip, Graham. So you uh, pick up on some of the details you talked about earlier. So you've got uh, heads going on the inside of you from the... Um, so you've got yeah. the jumper coming down. You've got a Etosia then put immediate yeah. pressure on the jumper. You've then got the two players either side of Etosia trying to then get into the into those seams between the jumper and his lifters. Um, 
and then it's interesting with then Chesham on the on the outside of that with his head on the outside. Um, it's probably worth worth noting that uh, where you are on the field matters as to what those uh, that third player does. Um, they tend to keep their head on the outside because of those breakaway plays, the plus one plays. If your head goes on the inside, then you're you're dust as uh, as, as you might say. So it's, it's hard hard to defend if your head's on the inside. That's then different when you get near the goal line. When you just you need all heads in because of the obviously the the obvious uh, mole threat. And I think uh, that's an important thing. If you are if you do have the facility to analyze your opposition, look at how they bind in. If they bind heads inside, they want to drive you. If they're binding heads outside, they're looking to spin it. England see it. It, uh, it seems to me the roles and responsibilities of England players is that there there are four that are looking to get heads inside and impact and drive, and then you've got one or two who are always looking to keep the head on the outside and spin without changing their bind. But on that last example, without doubt, Underhill changed his bind with his left hand. He went short. There was a short bind, then he stretched his bind. For me, that should have been uh, that should have been a penalty. So you're absolutely right. I'd, I'd back there as a penalty, actually, Griff, but too late now. <laughs> this is very good defence from Wales. If you watch here, Wales, one of the one of the reasons line outs the uh, malls fail, whether you're attack or defence, is a having too many numbers with their heads up or backs turned and B, being too wide. If you look here, Wales hits on impact, and these two players go on the inside of the line of three and just hit it hard, and just get it moving. And you know, now in England are basically they're playing on the back foot, nines under pressure, they've got good line speed coming up here. And uh I just think it's just worth watching the impact of this first one again here. Everybody's heads down, they don't try and spin, they just hit and drive it in field. Now, the question earlier was about, could they come down the blind side? Well, yes, they could, but look how the momentum is taking them in field. And Mitchell never looks to his left at all, okay? And we've got one defender here. What we can't see is where the other defenders are. He's looked to his right again, and he goes to his right. Again, initial impact. England have got two players up with their backs to the opposition. Makes it difficult. I think the world number eight here, I think he should have hit that space here and not come on the outside. Coming on the outside, he created a line of four which gives England the advantage then because, like I say, my personal preference is three wide only. And now it becomes, if you look at this, he's having no effect, he's having no effect, and he's having no effect at stopping England's more. There's an important moment there, isn't there, Graham, when uh, Wayne Wright makes the decision to come in on the on the edge of that mall. Um, which uh, was not particularly effective when he's gone in. Uh, tough one to defend because England, they've run a bit of a shift there. They? So they've got uh, Dan Cole doing a grand job of just trying to squeeze off those uh, edge defenders to give Vitoja then a path to just slide off, uh, slide off the corner of it. Um, but yeah, Wainwright could definitely come in more square there, couldn't he? If you, uh, yeah, he could have done. But if you look at, if he is going to be a proactive defender and he's legal, he hasn't changed his mind, etc. Then he's got his head in completely the wrong place because he can't see Danny Care. He's got no chance of getting to Danny Care with his 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 width of his feet here. Okay. 
So he, he's not an effective defender of the ball anyway. So he might have he might as well have made himself an effective defender on the hit, as you said. The uh, the French defence now uh, will will sort of um, demonstrate about this whole width. Just look how France are trying to defend this. One, two, three, four, five wide. Okay, um, I think this is um, by here. Uh, it, he should be hitting in here somewhere. And if you watch how this evolves, Ireland, the three wide, it collapses, yeah. But I think, however it collapsed, on another day, Ireland drive that over from there. One of the negatives for Ireland is they've got two players standing up and uh, with their backs to the opposition. But... Just look how disconnected the whole of the French mall defence is. The France take very much of a, of a split in the force, don't they? They they have uh, they go opposite to what you've suggested, uh, and having the four or five players across the front trying to get into as many scenes as they can to split the the mall before it gets going. So I, I can imagine France would have previewed Ireland and said. We we cannot let their mall get going in the first place. So if that, if they get driven, then they've failed. So potentially yeah, they've I'm decided, not. can we just get split every seam available and just kill it at source? Um and, and a collapse is they probably take that as a real real win, wouldn't they? I, I yes, I, I agree. The, the the problem with having a game plan is that you know, when you get that first punch in the face, it's failed and, and France got punched in the face and they didn't change. And, mm -hmm. and you've got to look at it and say, right, that's not working. We need to change. Again, outside the 22, I would uh, I would go aerial here personally, put pressure on Ireland's throw. Just have a look at... Uh, Let me just go back a little bit there. Hold on. What's these two guys here? What is their role? Where are they looking when the ball is caught? He's looking up. Can't quite see where he's looking. If this guy is going to target this guy here with this guy then they should be down together even the three who are already binding to hit on impact are a little bit high one two three one two three and two so you can see there's a good length to the um island wall They've got two players driving, driving forward. Um, is this Antonio? Is it? Yeah. Have I got the name right? Um, uh, I'm not quite sure what he's doing there. A guy of that size and weight, he needs to be putting himself right in the, uh, the centre of this to try and stop it. Yeah, effectively, that's what five or six players against two, isn't it? Um, again, France actually do a decent job of of getting their studs in the ground and putting some weight in front of it, um, and stop Ireland from get getting going. Um, but it, obviously, there's a there's a number of points in the game where Ireland just walked over France, and, and I think that comes from that uh, very very high risk reward strategy from France. Yeah, and and the other thing to think about on on that clip is. What was Ireland's intention? It to me it seemed Ireland had a very good mall structure going forward, and their intention was to just get France on the back foot. But don't forget, a good mall is the same as a good scrum. It doesn't have to be a, a 20, 30 meter driver or a five meter pushover to be effective. 
All you want for your backs is the ball to be quick and the opposition backs on their heels. And 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 I think that's what Ireland were trying to achieve there. Yeah. We've got, I think it's three or four in there, and they actually drive the Irish line out back. So we've now got this area here, the seam of the mall. I personally would be asking this this guy, the prop, to stay out. He he goes in and he's totally ineffective, and it leaves a dangerous space. Yeah, it's a really good point. Yeah, we've got um, it's a great point tactically, here. isn't it? Um, the, with, with him going in, Graham, uh, would you, w w why would you suggest that he made the decision to go in? W what's your thinking? Um, well, I, 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 I honestly don't know. I mean, I could be flippant and just say he thought he might be look as if he's doing something and his coaches might take note, but he didn't really do anything. If if he'd have gone into the centre of mass and added his 120 kilos into it and got them going back at pace and they still came out with the ball, you say, right, OK, you did something. You added some impact. That's fair enough. But he just seemed to sort of latch onto the side of the mall and had no real impact. It was already going forward. If it had been if it had been static and not going or going um backwards, then yes, you've got to engage. But it was going forward. There was four players driving it forward. He didn't need to engage. He could have been uh, France could have had three defenders in this space now. Okay. And they've got one. And so they're they're really isolated in this situation. Uh, sorry, I didn't run it long enough to see what the outcome was, but I think um, the Fleer popped the ball to a runner, and that runner uh, punched off the shoulder of the first defender. Yeah, it's easy game, um, isn't it? It's it's probably worth just raising it, the kind of cat and mouse of the mall. Yeah, um, in the if you if you never drive a mall, so if you always break away, then you never you never get that kind of situation arising. So it's Ireland have been incredibly cute there, haven't they? In in driving yeah. a few malls, not breaking out. And then when France think they're on top, all of a sudden Ireland are off. So it, it, I think it's real, real, uh, real cute to tactical tactical play. I I totally agree with you. And the other thing is I watch a lot of rugby and and um if you watch the, the premiership, um if you watch the Six Nations. I think we maul the ball too much. I don't think there's enough variation on what we do. I can't think of a shift maul in the last two or three years that stands out to me. I can't think of a back peel on a fake maul or a front peel on a fake maul or um, a, a ball off the top and giving it to the backs. And this is a tight head prop sitting here telling you that the backs should get the ball now and again. That's too much of Streety's influence. Um, but we used to work on the principle that we, we wanted to score in ways that would um, fatigue the opposition. So driven scrums. And not. And when I say that, I don't mean uh, to get a penalty. I mean to score a try. We didn't scrummage for penalties. We scrummaged for tries. Mauling to wear out the opposition. But if you're in a game where you've had two or three and it's not working, then you've got to vary it a bit. You've got to get them thinking. If you, if you allow them to think this is what you do, then you're not really changing things up. And the players on the field have got to do it as well. Mm. You know, you can't just keep sending... I, I It baffles me sometimes when I see coaches sending these messages on. I, I, I just watch the TV thinking, what the hell have they got to talk about so much? It baffles me. Ooh, There's so much messages. information going to messages. players. But the players are going, oh, I could tell you a story about Katie McLean, but we haven't got time. Um, so it, it, it is about variation and understanding when to vary what you do. Okay. Teams would expect a catch and drive 
five metres out, so why not give it the backs? Teams will expect off the top at halfway, so why not catch and drive it? Just change things up a little bit. So this is the line out that started that discussion. Now, the interesting thing about this line out, as you watch it, it's, I, I, I mean, analysing this is very difficult because it's just a mess from both teams. There's no connections from either team. Players get isolated. Um, I'm not sure what France's intention was to start with. The prop on the Irish prop on the far side doesn't know whether it's legal or not. Um, and we've just got a little bit of a game of Ringa Ringa Roses, really. Let's just go back to the start of this next line out. Right, just watch this because I think France miss a huge trick here. Well, I actually think Ireland do as well. If you watch this, it's hugely underthrown and the receiver does incredibly well to catch it with his right arm just on his hip. So it's not a great setup. But look at Ireland's defence. All the faces are up. This allows France the time to get them all in. So you've got four wide, everybody standing up, so they're never in a position to drive. Um, and, and it gives France the opportunity to get a structure that was never there. And now suddenly Ireland are defending in ones and twos. There's about three or four different change of binds and the referee comes in with a penalty. And, you know, I think that, that was a fair a fair call there. There was three or four different players that changed their bind three or four different times. If you just look at this one. So, Great decision here from Ireland. They're going aerial at the front, five metres from their own line. But the guys at the back have a real clear understanding of what their role and responsibility is if the, uh, the, the receiving pod get the ball. Heads are down before the ball is on the floor. If they can hold it, at source, it gives time for the uh, the jumping defence pod to get down and put their weight in. And as I said in the diagram, their target is the touchline. Now the penalty is gone for against uh, Ireland. I I'm not really sure. Brings a question in again about. What constitutes a collapse? Because if we hit them more harder than they can set it up and we've got them going backwards and we drive it to floor, is it a collapse? Just a just a thought that jumped into my head. Can, um, can, we, can we possibly go back to the start of this clip, Graham? There's there's some there's some real uh, interesting bits on that, that might be useful for coaches. Um, so this this is goal line, what I call goal line defense. So yeah. you notice you've got uh, Gibson Parks so a scrum half on the try line. So the way Ireland have looked yeah. to defend it, they've got their hooker in the channel. They've got their uh, winger then also in the channel back five. Uh, they've got then yeah. their eight yeah. Doris then uh, as the tail gunner and then Gibson Park behind. So it's, it's interesting that this is different to what it would be maybe 10 or 15 metres, depending on the team. 15 metres is, is a pretty standard cutoff. Um, where they would be outfield defence. This is goal line defence. Um, and that just means that uh, your, when you see uh, Burn on the um, 
so he put on the outside, uh, his head goes on the inside. So mentioned it further up the pitch, the head, the Chesham's head was outside. Mm -hmm. So ready for that plus yeah. one play. In this part of the field, they they prepped scrum half winger to cover some of those hinges. Uh, and the the mole defense is primary. So they'll go all heads inside and absolutely bang it. Well, not only that, uh, Gareth, but as this uh, Ireland's decision is to commit their force to stop this and, and get it to wherever they can, get it to ground or get it to touchline. And I think this is the one where we see uh, Bundiaki run in and defend on the um, mm -hmm. on the scene of the line out next to Gibson Park. Yeah. There. So uh, you'll see uh, the flare come through. He joined in as well, and then Gibson Park, uh, uh, Bundyaki has come in and taken up this uh, this position as that um, sort of short defence. Yeah, I think um, players understanding the difference between goal line defence and outfield defence is really important. Um, the, absolutely. Yeah, the, the moral threat is different. It comes down to knowing your roles and responsibilities. Don't forget, when I played, it was really goal line defence because the line out was on the goal line. <laughs> <laughs> um, and and uh, we'll finish with a try. Uh, and uh, I'll just let this run and then we'll go back to it. If you watch, France have hit this and, and France are trying to spin this as quickly as possible to create that chaos. But they never get connected. There's not one player that connects to a teammate in the, in the France defensive mall. So they just spin themselves out. Uh, Ireland recognise it and they drive against the spin and create the space to just go through. Okay, and that's the end of the video. Excellent, Graham. Thank you. Um, coaches, uh, do you have any any questions that you'd like, uh, anything that you'd like uh, to ask or anything you'd like further clarity on? Uh, now is your opportunity. So, question from Jeff. So, um, why don't teams sack more? What's your thoughts, Graham? Um, I don't know. Uh, I didn't put it in there because it's very rarely you see it nowadays. Um, I used to play with a guy called Chris Barber, a hooker, and he was the best sacker of them all I've ever seen. Um, he, he uh, to the point where he put himself in danger. Um, it's a very, very effective way of stopping them all at source. But you've got to be very quick to do it. Um, if you looked at the uh, diagrams I showed earlier about roles and responsibilities, if you think about the first one, which was defending the front line out, the, the, the process would work exactly the same. So the two outside players of the three would target separating and isolating. And then the centre player, the person who would drive the ball receiver, would actually just pull them over and sack them. But I, it's something that I, I, it seems to be sliding out of the game slightly. Uh, I think it's a good tactic. I, I don't think it's something you can do every time because teams will then work it out and, and work out to um, how to... Um, uh, how to uh, counter it, but it's something that seems to be slipping out the game. Uh, I'll give you a couple of reasons, uh, Jeff. Um, I think the uh, getting the sack right is really difficult. Um, so the, the as soon as the mall comes down, that first person is able to do so. If they don't get it right, then you don't have a mall defence. So that's that that that's one reason. Um, another reason that at the elite level. 
uh, and to be honest, my under 18s are, are really, really good at this. Uh, they they identify where there's a sack come in within an instant, and they just don't they don't punch. So we 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 focus a lot on as an attack in mall. Uh, the as soon as the ball comes down, we punch into it. If we know there's a sack come in, they don't punch. So you you just you almost allow them to do part of the job for you um, by one play coming into in fact Bristol tried to do it yesterday and it just played into our hands. We scored four ball tries off the back of it. So uh, they one player tries to sack you just hold still. He comes and tries to drag you. We've got three guys holding him up and then you just pile over them. Um, and if you then go down, it's then a penalty, uh, which we also won a number of. Um, it's it's really hard to get right would be one thing. Uh, it's also really easy to coach and attack to be really um, wise to it. I think on that, uh, uh, nobody's brought it up again, but on that, um, uh, the question of uh, defending teams not engaging, um, and uh, you know, uh, I personally, and uh, this might sound odd. Um, uh, teams that don't engage them all like that, I find is a sign of cowardice. Um, and uh, I, there's a lot of teams we play against that do it. So we we have worked on plans for the last two years that that if they stand down, we we can do something straight away. Um, it, it, when I say stand down, they don't engage. They just stand there, and 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 then suddenly you've got a stalemate. Um, uh, and and try as constructively as possible, bring the referee's attention to the to the fact that most teams that don't engage also take a step away, which is absolutely. the illegal part of it. Yeah. Um, so, uh, but yeah. So you know, I <laughs> I don't I don't coach it. I don't like it. There's there's a there's an old school tight head prop in my head that says. If it's a game of rugby, there's a collision point. Come and come and make a collision with me. Don't just stand there, you know. Well, I'm a scrum half but... and I feel the same. Um, <laughs> I I actually like the fact that other teams do it against my team um, because uh, it's really good for the for the players to learn uh, how to overcome it, and it's it's actually. It's pretty simple to overcome. Um, I love it when teams do it now, uh, and I love it when our, our boys know that they're doing it and they react really quickly. But always yeah. make sure that the captain speaks to the referee before the game and says, "Okay, uh, I, I'm pretty certain they're going to step off, sir. So I'm pretty certain they've spoken to you about it already. Um, if they decide not to engage them all, are they allowed to step backwards? Uh, yeah, make sure you ask those questions early on, but make sure that's in his mind. And then we, we, the boys have already got plans in the mind for what they'll do. But um, yeah, it's sort of strategy I would coach. It's so hard not to engage. You don't step back, isn't it? It's quite. Yes, it's. Uh, yeah. You know, if they don't step back, you, you can just drag them in. So, literally that, literally that, and that's one of the strategies, yeah. isn't it? Of uh, your when your jumper comes down, just <laughs> one of the boys uh, grabs him. Um, no, you don't oh, yeah. get it. We, we actually worked on the, um, particularly if the ball was, we, we caught the, the ball at the front and they stood uh, they stood off. Um, we got the, um, the front lifter, which in our case was the loose head prop, to actually slingshot the um, the ball carrier as he landed and he just went straight through. It worked a couple of times. Mm -hmm. um, so, you know, just... And, and I think an important point I should make before we finish about all this thing about the, the, the mall defence and about the, the hitting and driving and aerial or whatever, um, one of the most important things is you've got to, you've got to um, have a really good understanding of what your players are capable of um, and, and not try to do things that they're not capable of. And I've, I find that um, uh, certain coaches uh, uh, that I've experienced over many, many years, I've been doing this a, a long time now uh, as, as a professional coach, and, and uh, sometimes we see things that we think, oh, that looks good, we'll try that. And, and you know, you've got to always remember that we don't have um, Dan Carter playing 10. Um, 
we, we don't have John Alonso on the wing. We, we've got what we've got, and we've got to be able to play to what we've got. Mm -hmm. Yeah, absolutely. Okay, and any other questions, coaches? No, but I'll be uh, putting some of that in, in, at work tomorrow night. Good. Please do your it. Um, in that case, uh, everybody, thank you all for uh, coming on live. And uh, those of you who are catching up with the recording, I really hope that you've enjoyed it. If you do have any questions or any comments, uh, feel free to put them down in the comment section. Uh, I'll be sure to get back to you. Um, otherwise, thank you very much, Graham. That was fantastic. Uh, really good insight. Um, and I will look forward to speaking to you again soon. Thanks very much for inviting me. I've uh, I've really enjoyed it. Uh, most importantly, guys, just keep pushing the word around about Street T on the auction, uh, on the GoFundMe, and uh, thank you very much.